Welcome to the very first episode of Chinese Food Fight Club. This is a podcast inspired by a dinner party series that Andy Wong and I used to host in New York starting in 2011. And since this is the inaugural episode, Andy and I thought we would take turns interviewing each other about what we remember about that time and the origins of Chinese Food Fight Club, what it meant to us and why it's now a podcast slash multimedia platform. Hi, Andy. Yeah. How are you doing? Hi, Danica. I'm excited about this. I mean, we've been talking about this with ourselves and with a select group of friends for so long, but this is really the first time we've, we're going to go deep and talk a lot about this publicly. So this is going to be a familiar and also a different experience. I'm excited. So exciting. So I, I have three questions for you about Chinese Food Fight Club. So let's start at the beginning and I guess we can just see where the conversation takes us. So I wrote it down on a post, post it. And my first question is, Andy, what were you doing in 2011? And at the time, pre-Legend, and we'll explain what Legend is in a second, yes. what were your favorite restaurants? So I was working at the New York Post. Um, uh, I was the real estate editor at the time. This is before I crossed over and became the travel editor. But at the time, um, uh, our good friend David Lanzel was the travel editor. And David had this ridiculous schedule where he would just come in whenever the fuck he wanted, leave whenever he wanted. And because he was the travel editor and our bosses were on a different floor, they never even knew where he was. I know this is a slight digression, but I just want people to understand how wild west it was. I would put out the real estate section once a week and I'd barely be monitored the rest of the time. Like somehow I didn't have to go into any meetings. David, they didn't expect to be in at all. So there are many times where David's bosses, you know, Chris Shaw, Joe Rabinowitz, would just like call me and say, hey, Andy, do you know where David is? And David might be five feet away from me. I'm just like, you guys like clearly are not paying attention. He's in the building right now, you know? So that's how loose it was. And with that type of looseness, David and I got to eat, you know, lots of different food. We would go to whatever Queens to eat at M. Wells, or sometimes we would go to Flushing. But Back then, before Legend, what I remember is that there's a restaurant called Sichuan Gourmet um, uh, that had um, uh, two outposts, one that was south of where we were and another one that um, opened north of where we were near Columbus Circle. And we would just get lunch from there all the time because they had great mapa tofu and good danta noodles and um, uh, double cooked pork and just all the food that we associated with good Sichuan food. We were also half a block away from Wulong Ye, which was sort of the granddaddy of all the Sichuan restaurants. And we got Dantan noodles there a lot, but we were just lucky because there's all this food that popped right around where we were. So the other two that we loved, and I mean, Minar is gone, but Minar was a great Indian restaurant, casual Indian restaurant. We'd get cilantro chicken on Fridays and Margon was just the best and still is the best place just to go and get a plate of, you know, two and a half pounds of Cuban food, pepper steak, pepper steak, you know, ropa vieja, roast chicken, you know, with rice and beans and plantains. So yeah, we ate a lot of heavy food during our days at the New York Post, but that's what I remember doing before Legend. I feel like that was such a moment in Midtown. There were maybe eight to 10 good restaurants in Midtown, and that was Back in the day when Midtown Lunch, that blog used to be a thing and people would follow it rapidly to see what was new and what was opening up. It was early, early days of content driven digital and social media was just starting to take off. Right. I think like Twitter and Instagram were just I don't even know if Instagram was around back then, but Twitter had just started. Yeah, I wasn't on Instagram. It was around then. Yeah. Yeah, it was. It was also new. and. You know, I guess we can just get into it. The way that we discovered Legend, I mean, like I had heard about it. I'd read about it on Chowhound, I think. And then I saw it on Twitter. Now, the thing that you have to understand about Twitter back then is that Twitter was not like the calculated performative thing that it is now. You know, there weren't a lot of people sitting around all day thinking, oh, I'm going to like figure out how to put out the perfect, perfect tweet because it's going to get engagement, right? There was or no retweet button. It was just you had to put RT. Oh, yeah. And like right. copy. 
Right. I remember like seeing people do that. And like for the first time, for the first like two months, I thought RT meant like real time. But then I'm like, that doesn't make any sense. That's how little we were actually paying attention to what this was, right? Before it became this all consuming thing for a lot of people. So the point is, is people just tweeted whatever they wanted, right? And there were, and they didn't really think about consequences. And this was back then also when Facebook statuses were really, in a lot of ways, sometimes about what you were doing. And the Facebook status would just be like, Andy is, and it would be just like, Andy is going to eat nachos tonight or whatever. People would just post it like this every day. That's, I mean, it feels really innocent compared to now, obviously. Before you found out about like all the different levels that like it's changed and altered and perhaps ruined our lives. But so what happened is that we'd already read about this place. Um, uh, and then we decided to go eat Sichuan food. Cause I'd heard there's this good Sichuan restaurant um, uh, on 15th street, not far from where you live, Danica. And I told David lands all about it. And then right around the same time, David Chang tweeted. And again, this was back then when again, tweets were just like, whatever, whatever I'm thinking, I'm just going to tweet. David Chang tweeted, Legend was not the primary thought. He tweeted about some restaurant in Brooklyn and said, you know, thanks. I had a great meal there. And then second thought in the same tweet. Oh, by the way, legend is the legend in Chelsea is the best Sichuan food in New York. And so at that moment, I'm just like, wait, what? And so the context also needs to be given is that I was not deep into food media at the time. We were writing about food at the post occasionally, but you know, that was not my beat. So I knew of David Chang. David Chang was certainly a high profile chef and we very much liked his restaurants at the time, but I did not know David Chang. I mean, I know since then I've written a lot of stories about Chang. His team has given me exclusives. Chang obviously lives in LA now, you know, and I would say that we're friendly, but back then David Chang was just a chef whose work I admired, who tweeted about something. And then we decided, all right, we were already going to go eat such on food. Now we have to go really hard. I think at the time, Chang had this reputation as being a chef's chef. When I think back, and, and this was way before I got into food media, pure food media, I was a fashion writer at the New York Post. And I sat like 10 feet away from you and David, basically. And at the times, I think someone, at the, I think a food critic was out one week. And the editor assigned me a story about Momofuku noodle bar. And I was like, you want me to write a food story? And they're like, yeah, 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 just write this story. It's this restaurant in the East Village that all the chefs go to after shift is over to eat and they order the entire menu. And I was like, what kind of story is this? <laughs> and I remember <laughs> phoning up and I was, I was like a, a young reporter. This is my first job out of school. I phoned up Momofuku and I think Dave Chang like picked the phone up and I interviewed him on the phone about how all of his chef friends would just come to the restaurant in the middle of night and like order everything on the menu. And it didn't even occur to me. This was probably like mid, like between sometime between 2003 and 2010, but this was before everything blew up. And yeah, this was before there was data on social media. No one was writing engage. The word engagement in social media wasn't even a a blip on the radar. We had no idea what anything would become. Social media was a dumping ground of authenticity and thoughts and nothing was sponsored. There were, there were no real agendas behind these quick, like a hundred, I don't even know if it was 140 characters. It may have only been 120 characters at the time. Right. So I, I think that there was, there was a level of trust that you could have in these strange one-off thoughts that people were putting out there. And I think for the longest time, actually, we were not allowed to be on social media as reporters at the post. And obviously that, that rule changed pretty quickly, but anyway, so after Andy saw this tweet, I think he started an email chain and David and I were on the email chain and we decided to go to this restaurant, not really knowing very much besides just showing up there. And we, when you showed up at legend and legend used to be on 15th and seventh, and you showed up there, we were all like, this is it. This is like a neighborhood Greenwich Village, not even really West Village, 7th Avenue. It was across from Jensen Lewis, that furniture store. It was, it was a run-of-the-mill looking neighborhood Chinese restaurant. And we had a great meal there, just like, you know, the three of us. Or I think I think Aaron was there also for the four of yeah, us. Yeah, my wife Aaron was there too. So yeah, David Lanzel, me, you, Danica, and Aaron, I think was the first time. 
Yeah. And then, and then we heard that we had done it wrong. And this was the turning point. Like this was the moment when just going to a good Sichuan food, like restaurant in New York city, this is when Chinese food fight club was crystallized. When Andy talked to one of his friends who told us about a secret, not really secret, but like an open secret dining event that happened every Friday night at legend in the Gren- in Greenwich village. So Andy, do you want to talk through this? Because this all came through you. Yeah. So this was just random occurrence of knowing people in New York. Right. So I had, um, I met my friend Federica Faust, I think at the opening of the cosmopolitan in Las Vegas, where Carol Chen, who's going to be a big part of our podcast in the near future, she introduced us. So Federica was, you know, she wasn't a chef, but she was in the food world. She was an entrepreneur and she just very much liked food. And I trusted her opinion very much. So Federica told me, oh, you went to Legend. Did you go to that dinner? And did you, what did you think of all these dishes? And what was it like to eat with strangers? And I'm just like, what are you talking about? This is New York City. Like, who's eating with strangers? And then she explained to me, she started laughing, I think. She explained to me. Whatever food you ate at Legend, and I told her that we ate a lot of the traditional Sichuan food because, you know, we were there. We got mapo tofu. We, you know, got the popcorn chicken with all the chilies. She goes, yeah, that's all good, but you won't believe what actually happens at this restaurant. So on Friday nights, and she told me that there's going to be all these rules, and she would explain them later. You could go downstairs at Legend, and they had set up these huge tables for banquets that anybody could just walk down there, sit down without a reservation you know, without any real like proper planning, you could totally do this impromptu. If there's an open seat at the table, you just sit down and the chef sends out all these special dishes. And so I'm like, okay. And I told you, Dennis, but I think I did it via email. And I remember writing the email, but this is, this is like fight club. And the reason that it was like fight club is that there were these rules. And I think you remember some of them from the email, Danica. So tell me what it was like getting this email and what was in that email. Okay. I, have scoured my Gmail for this email, but I think it was actually in like my work email and I no longer have it. And this is a lesson to you guys to save everything for for posterity for the day you launch a podcast about a dinner you once had. But I remember being really nervous because we had been to Legend and then we heard about this communal dining experience. And then Andy got this email that was like, one, you can only go as a single person or in pairs. And I was like, I'm not going to go to a dinner with strangers by myself. That sounds scary. But I was like, okay, well, maybe we can each take one person with us. And then two was say nothing to anybody when you go in the restaurant. I was like, like yeah, don't check in. Walk past the host or hostess. It's like, why? Like, why? Why? And I was like, that sounds weird too. And then we didn't even know there was a downstairs. We had been there and I think we had sat upstairs in like one of those little like banquette booth things. And we were like, all right, this is just normal restaurant. But there was a whole downstairs that we were not aware of. And so th- there were those two rules. And then three, I think she, I I think I want to, I want to say she said this, but she was like, when the waitress comes out, just sit there quietly and don't try to order <laughs> because she's like, I, everyone else will do the ordering for you. And when, When you and I finally went and we took Carla and another friend with us, we went in two by two. I think like we're standing outside. I was like, Andy, you go in first. You go in first. I was scared to go in the four of us because we weren't allowed to. Right. And then we decided because, you know, the two people that we're with were white that like, all right, one Asian goes down with one white person. So we did that. Oh, and I think the other thing Federica just said, too, was just like, it's not going to be expensive, but bring cash because you really are going to end up splitting a bill like 18 ways. And I'm like, okay, this is really going to happen. So we walked down um, uh, and we walked down uh, me and the white person that I took down, sat down and I found Federica and it, you know, took the edge off a little bit. Cause I'm like, okay, I know one person here. We sat down at the table where Federica was, and then you and Carla walked down and there happened to be two seats right by us so you I was sat like down. thank god like, yeah, thank that god really, calmed, not that really table. calmed us down because like we were new yorkers at the time and, you know not the chill la person i am now so the idea of like hanging out with fucking strangers is something that you just you don't do this in new york like without any context you know 
But I think that was probably one of the most powerful things about that. And that that just went on indefinitely. I think that you and I probably went like maybe one additional time. But I, but I think what was so interesting to me and probably to, I mean, to all of us who are experiencing this for the first time is the power of food and the power of a regional Chinese cuisine to draw individuals who just wanted to taste their food. They just really wanted to like, you know, it's, it's like a homesickness, but it's not a homesickness. It's like just something you need to like feel is to feel the taste whole, of mala, yeah. right? To have that fish, fish soup, to have like just, it's a taste of home and people would come by themselves after work because maybe their family doesn't want to come and eat this food. Maybe their friends don't like spicy food, but it was such a powerful draw and it brought 20 strangers to every single table and you sat there and you ate a communal dinner and you all put 20 bucks on the table. And that was like more than enough to cover it. And you all just had this really great New York experience. I guess it was sort of like a flash mob dinner. If you think about it, it it, it was a flash mob dinner. And obviously like some people became friends and there were certainly people, you know, that were Chinese immigrants there who really did like miss the food or just the feeling of the food at home. But for us, we had been eating Sichuan food in New York for like more than, you know, like for more than a decade at this point and going to this dinner and I'm going to steal a line from my, from my food writer friend, Garrett Snyder, because he wrote this so nicely about this Thai restaurant in LA. This was like seeing new colors, right? Where I'm just like, or at the very least, you know, it's like you're seeing different shades of the things that you loved, but then realized, wait, like this tone is the better expression of this, right? So we had eaten lots of mala food before, but yeah, this is like nuanced fish soup, right? That was like sour and spicy and deeply savory and umami. This crispy pork hock where like every piece that you took, you would just get the crunch of the skin, like the best chicharron that you had, that you had ever had, right? And then just all of these other things, right? There was offal on the table. There were cold vegetables on the table. The chef just did whatever he wanted. And it was definitely not like when you go to such one restaurant and you just think, oh, they have spicy dumplings and they have danta noodles and then popcorn chicken. Yeah, that dude had all of this too. That dude also had Vietnamese food and like Kung Pao chicken on his menu because there's one of those restaurants like this is a neighborhood restaurant. We don't give a fuck. We know how to make all of this. But it was clear that like this Sichuan food that was then at the time obscure was like where his heart was. And he cooked the hell out of it. And once we knew what the dishes were, then we just decided, okay, we don't really have to eat with strangers. And we just had countless meals upstairs with lots of our people. And we just ordered these dishes and then got to watch them, you know, including some prominent food media that we brought experience this for the first time and also lose their mind. You know, maybe not quite as much as we did because not all of them were Chinese American, but a lot of them were still just like, wow, I've never had this. I think there is something, and I think, um, yeah, I, I mean, Andy, I think you're understating it a little bit because actually what Andy and I ended up doing was we became the unofficial evangelists for legend until it closed a few years ago. And what that means is we didn't just bring a a couple of friends here and there. Sometimes we would go there like five times in a span of two weeks and once in a while, we would organize these large dinners where we would book a table downstairs in that banquet floor, which I mean, this is, oh, banquet floor is overstating. It was a floor with a lot of big round tables, but we would book yeah. one of those tables. Andy would invite 10 people. I would invite 10 people. And then we would sit down and we would try to simulate that feeling of creating connections between people based on food. And it was, for me, that was really powerful. And we just started jokingly calling it Chinese food fight club. And we would tell everyone the origin story about all the rules. And everyone's like, well, oh my gosh, like I would never want to follow those rules. I'm like, don't worry, come to our version. And it was just (laughs) a way of us showing our friends and the people who are really important to us in our lives who didn't necessarily know about Chinese food beyond Panda Express or their local Chinese restaurant where they would get like wonton soup. It was our way of showing people something that we couldn't put our finger on about our heritage. And I think in retrospect, it's so much more meaningful than we knew at the time, because I do think, I mean, 
you and I both have so many stories about how we like, it was almost like conversion. And that's why I use all these religious metaphors, but you <laughs> brought some really important food people over to the legend side and, and they became huge, fra- huge fans. Yeah. I mean, you know, you brought fashion people. We both brought media people. I brought real estate people. I bought food people. We ended up getting, we, I ate there with people that were like prominent people in the music industry. There was just all the stuff that was going on, like people that were like in the VC world, right? This was just the type of people that you would know when you worked at a newspaper like the New York Post, right? And they would become your friends. And then a lot of them just ended up being super down. And the thing that I sort of remember uh, maybe the most is something that I didn't do at Legend. When I left New York City, my wife and I had a going away party. And that, look, we were at the New York Post, so we went to all the whatever, quote unquote, sceny places. It was our job to cover that stuff, right? So we threw a party, a going away party on the rooftop of Catch, which was this really hot restaurant from this nightlife group turned restaurant group. And one of the real estate kids that I know, who's like, you know, spent as much money in the meatpacking district partying as anybody I know, wrote me and it said, Andy, Thank you for the invite. I'm happy to go hang out at Catch with you, but you have to tell me when you're doing your secret going away party at Legend because I know that's the real party. At that point, I'm like, fuck, I didn't think about that at all. But we had converted these people who usually just like whatever, went to Provocateur and buy bottles and like go to Nobu 57 every single week and they, they wanted to go there. And then in terms of the food world, the story that I always remember is um, uh, I was there with my good friend, Josh Wesson, um, uh, who's just this wine expert who owns restaurants, you know, involved in wine stores, consulted on wine menus for JetBlue. He just like knows everybody. He's been around forever. I took him to Legend. It's just the two of us. We order like eight dishes and his mind's just like blown. I go down to wash my hands and I look around and I start to get a little pissed off because I'm like, what the fuck is going on? Jeff Zelaznik who's a partner in major food group, the restaurant group that has Carbone and Teresi is here. I don't even know if Carbone was open at the time that this happened, but they had Teresi is here. Mario Carbone is here. And some other people I recognize are here. And I was the one that had taken Jeff to this restaurant a few weeks ago. And I had this moment of like weird FOMO because I'm like, number one, why am I not invited? Number two, this is my restaurant. How dare you do this? It's like this weird, like New York (laughs) response. But number three, I was actually really happy to see them. But what had happened is that Jeff liked this restaurant so much. He decided to have like his family and close friends birthday party there. So he just took over the downstairs. And when I realized he had done that, I was so happy for him and for Legend because I'm like, wow, you actually do have the right taste and you do care about the real food. And it's not just about this other thing. I mean, I knew this about them already, and it sounds pretentious that I'm saying this, but you do have to understand that like a lot of New York restaurateurs, you know, they just like eat at their friends' places, right? Because they're busy all the time or they eat the same two or three things. The fact that like Jeff made an effort to like call this restaurant and get the downstairs. So, you know, that was one prominent example, but there's so many other food people that we took there. I mean, you took Amanda Clute and Greg Morabito who were running Eater LA at the time. I mean, Amanda obviously runs all of Eater now. And they flipped out and Greg, you know, wrote about it. But the other thing that was amazing about this is that legend still never became one of those like restaurants that got mass media coverage. It was still mainly a neighborhood restaurant that got nice mentions, but it did not get in like the best of lists or did not get a Pete Wells review. So it was still kind of ours. It did make it on because of the Amanda and Greg thing. It did actually make it onto an Eater 38 list for a Mm -hmm. few months. And I think that was right before the New York Times reviewed it. And I actually was looking through my email because I was looking for your original legend email. And I saw an email from David that sent us a link for the legend review in the New York Times. And we're like, oh crap, we're never going to be able to get in there now. And I think for a period of six weeks after that, we couldn't get into legend. And it was was, was a little harder. But the thing to point out is that like this wasn't the primary review in the New York Times. This wasn't Pete Wells. This is like for their 25 and under. So they relegated legend. And that simultaneously pissed me off, but also made it really happy because I'm like, if this was the fucking primary review, we'd be fucked. Because the thing about legend, too, is that we went all the time there. Yes, the servers recognized us. But this is a type of neighborhood restaurant where there was no VIPing. We never got sent an extra dish. I just want people in the restaurant industry to know, right? Like 
you go to all these other places in New York, you know, the people you build relationships, restaurant tours, go to each other's places, you know, and they just get super VIP. That's just how they do it. Legend was just not in that orbit. They did not know, or they did not care at all. There were so many prominent chefs that went there all the time. And I truly believe that none of them, you know, ever got VIP except maybe that like, at the end, they got sent a plate of fruit or something. That was like legend being like, okay, we really, really like you, you know? I but mean, in was, fact, in fact, Andy, you and I would go there so much. They definitely recognized us. And especially the woman who worked at the bar, because you would sometimes go eat at the bar by yourself. But if anything, we were never comped. Obviously, we were never really given a discount, but we were made fun of for ordering too much food every single time, yeah. which is like a very, to me, that's like a very authentically Chinese way of showing affection. So that means they liked us, I think. Yeah. And it was also like just this like chill neighborhood restaurant and you would forget where you were sometimes. And I still kind of want to apologize to this family that sat next to us once, because, you know, you go to a New York restaurant, right? You go to Momofuku, you go to Catch, you go to Tertulia, which was around the corner, not far from Legend. I remember like I brought leftovers from Legend to a couple parties there. I'm sorry, Seamus Mullen, but I'm glad that you're such a food person. You understand. You go to these other restaurants and it's New York energy. It's New York vibe. It's loud. You talk about whatever you want. You talk the craziest shit. But there's one day at Legend where I had forgotten that this was also just a chill neighborhood restaurant. And there's just a nice family sitting next to our table, you know, with their child who was like maybe like a nine or 10 year old girl. And our table is just doing the normal thing. Like there's some guy at the table who had like been dating a porn star. So people were starting to talk about this porn star and that porn star. And the mom actually looked over at me because she thought I was the voice of reason and just said to me, I'm really sorry. I know you guys are having a good time, but my daughter doesn't know what a porn star is yet. So could you maybe talk about something else? And then I was just like, oh, yeah, people are just treating this as their nice neighborhood restaurant. We can't fucking pretend that we're like at Mr. Chow or, Mr. or at Nobu or something. We've got to be chill and respect what this is. That was upstairs. But then the thing that we realized, or we can just go downstairs and you can do whatever the fuck you want, because that felt like this other crazy New York party, you know? There, there, it, and that is the thing about, I mean, Legend was almost our version of the Cheers bar, except they had Sichuan food. And this is one of the questions I wrote down and I wanted to ask you because I don't think we've ever like put our finger on it. So the, on my post-it, I wrote, we often talk about how no restaurant has ever really cl come close in our psyches to like reach that benchmark that we've set that we, it's almost like the Legend benchmark. What are the characteristics that could bring a restaurant even into this ballpark? I mean, number one, it's just the most craveable food possible that you just think of again and again, right? So I guess the way for me to sort of explain how much I love Legend, right, is there was a day where I was playing poker in Midtown, you know, 20 blocks away from Legend, and it was a hot New York summer day. It was like more than 90 degrees. And New York, more than 90 degrees when it's humid, it's like death. But I basically walked from Herald Square to Legend, right? 20 blocks, sat at the bar, and I'm already sweating. And I just ordered the fish soup and I ate it by myself because it was the only thing in the city that I wanted to eat. Just like that combination of, you know, sour and savory, you know, and, and, and spicy. There would be times, like I said, where I'd bring food from Legend to another restaurant because I'd just been at Legend before I was supposed to go to this dinner. I used it to pregame and postgame for so many things. I mean, I think that like I brought food from legend to Teresa Italian specialties once. And those guys understood. So they were cool about it. But the thing that maybe they don't know, I mean, they'll be fine knowing this is that on one of my trips back to New York, like when they had opened the grill, my wife and I went and ate this crazy meal at the grill, prime rib, Dover sole, all of it. Cause it was like our first meal in New York. We were staying at an apartment that happened to be two blocks from legend. We eat dinner at grill. We at the grill, we leave at like nine o'clock. We get to the apartment at like nine 30. Aaron is just like, all right, that was great. I'm going to watch TV and go to sleep. And I was like, wait, I bet I can go get takeout at Legend right now. And I don't have to eat it all. But do you know how happy I'm going to be in the morning to have this for breakfast? So number one, it's obviously food, right? Number two, just the fact that like 
there was no pretension whatsoever. Everybody just got treated the same. It was just this cool neighborhood restaurant. If you wanted to come in and eat egg rolls and Kung Pao chicken, you know, and Vietnamese noodles, fine. If you wanted, you know, the most like nuanced, but also just like intensely mala, Sichuan food, fine. Just come. You can like drink a $5 beer. It's not a big deal. You know, also back then we were the type of, we worked at the type of newspaper where you had to cover things like Momofuku Co., which was a type of restaurant that was so hard to book that people would basically like have their assistants or a concierge set an alarm, right? Or it would just be like, or it'd be like some new pasta restaurant that's open and the instructions are, you have to get there at 445 to get a 530 table or um, uh, we'd give recommendations. These are the best restaurants to go eat at at 1030 at night, right? Because that's the only time you could get into like certain Keith McNally restaurants or new or whatever, right? And they were fun then. Legend, Danica and I could decide, yes, we would take a big group there, but there are many times where it'd be Thursday at four o'clock. We're just like, we want to go Thursday at seven o'clock. And then we just went three, four people, no big deal. Sometimes it was like a 10 minute wait just for them to set up the table, but it was just never that big of a deal. And then the other thing I think is, um, uh, I mean, I know you did this too. This was also just food that traveled well. So you could get it delivered. You could take it to other people. And there was a lot of that. But I think this is the only place, and I've had a hard time even finding anything like this in LA, even though I love the food in LA so much, where, you know, I took, you know, some of the most A-list people that we covered in the New York Post, right? I took restaurateurs and chefs who had traveled anywhere and eaten everything. But I also took my family when they were visiting. And I took my friend who didn't want to go to a place that was a scene because they didn't want to get dressed up. And I took people who usually went to places that were totally seen and then went to legend, you know, and they brought their whatever $6,000 handbag and they showed me their new watch. And then they just sat here and like, what is going on? And then they came back again without me. And I'm like, yeah, this restaurant just has all these things. It's so it's, yeah, it's tangible and it's also intangible. Restaurants are about how they make you feel. And so somehow we made this completely accessible restaurant feel like our secret and our exclusive club, even though there was nothing exclusive about it ever. And I think that that is, I mean, that sums it up perfectly. I agree with everything you said. And if we can just pull out a little bit and this all dovetails into why we've decided to launch Chinese Food Fight Club, the podcast. It's to recapture that feeling, especially in 2021, in this day and age, that feeling of being somewhere that is unpretentious, but it feels special and that you're going to have an amazing experience and you're going to get exactly what you came for, which is amazing food and amazing conversation and amazing ideas. And I I think that that, I mean, that, that to me is why we want to launch this, this podcast. And I, and I think that we're, we're constantly on the search for people who are, who are making these experiences happen for other people. I sort of wonder sometimes too, and this was obviously way before I worked in food media, way before you worked in pure food media, but do you think maybe this was an early sign that we were going to work in food media. If, when you talked about Momofuku Co., when it opened, Carla, at the time, she was the food writer for the food editor for the New York Post. And she was trying to get a reservation at Co. And we decided we're going to cooperate and we would both try to get it. And like whoever got it would take the other person. And so I ended up getting it, but it took me two solid weeks of like setting a timer, syncing my clock on my computer with Co.'s clock and like doing all the hacks. And finally, I got us a table for two. And it was super amazing, super fun. But that kind of passion that you, David, and I, and, and all of us had for these amazing restaurant experiences that were, that was about the food and beyond. I think it just, it was, you know, it's like what they, what they call in like, you know, English class in high school foreshadowing of the future to come. And here we are 10 years later doing this. Yeah. And it feels like the foreshadowing for so many things, just those experiences, right? Because, you know, right now, like one thing that's happening, especially with the pandemic is there's all these really interesting, successful operators who are trying to do something like their own version of Soho House, right? And it's just like, it's a membership club for grownups. And you talk to any of them and they'll just be like, we've all done everything. We've all like partied in these situations. We're, we're not that young anymore. We want to be in a place where there's good food and you can have a conversation and just see people you love. And I hear that and I'm like, 
yeah, I feel you. I had this at this Sichuan restaurant. And I didn't have to pay a $6,000 a year membership fee or petition to be taken off the waiting list or, you know, like go in with somebody who's like a founder of some fucking fashion line. I mean, yeah, people like that went to legend, but they just went and, and it wasn't a big deal. So to me, it sort of felt like this thing, right? Like, yeah, it was, it was like our little clubhouse before clubhouse was the word used for social media. And I guess, you know, that's a good segue into me just bringing up. So in LA, I've had other dining clubs and names have been coined for them, right? Like there was a basically a lunch club around the San Gabriel Valley that was me, Chef Shirley Chung and Carol Chin called Dumpling Mafia, where we ate dumplings all over. But honestly, I think if Chinese Food Fight Club had not happened, I wouldn't be the type of person who would just think like, okay, this is the type of thing to do. Then my friend Crystal Kozer and I with some other friends in Los Angeles started some, a dining club that people just started calling LA Food Gang fine, very simple name. LA Food Gang was a name that we came up with because we didn't really want to give it a name, but somebody one day, like this artist who was drawing a picture of us, this artist napkin killer was like, what are you guys? And we're like, well, we're friends in LA who just go dine out all the time together. It's like, okay, you're the food gang in LA. So we became LA Food Gang. But that turned into a clubhouse group that Crystal convinced me to start. And I'm so thankful that she did this because that then led to activism where we did a fundraiser that raised money for Asian American small businesses and restaurants and another in-person fundraiser where we raised more money for Asian American restaurants. But I really believe that this is all tied to Chinese Food Fight Club. And that's why this is a good time for us to start this multimedia company, whatever you want to call it, because Chinese Food Fight Club, or at least Danica, I mean, more than that, our friendship and our shared love for such on food is what got us to this point. Sure, I was already friends with, I would have probably become friends with some of these people, but I don't think it would have happened at this level because it sort of connected both of us to our heritage in a way where we're like a lot of Chinese American kids, right? Where we like our Chinese food, we like our Chinese families, we have issues with our families, but we think our families are pretty good compared to a lot of the tiger mom shit that we've heard in the past. They've obviously like, we're journalists, you know, we're not doctors, you know, we're not engineers, et cetera. So that all is fine. But I think this restaurant really did help us connect to our roots, even though we're both Taiwanese, you know, we don't have a direct tie to the Sichuan province. But then years later, it really all came to a head for me in LA. Carolyn Shirley had already known the chef Yubo, who's been called the Ferran Adria of Chengdu, Ferran Adria of China who just does all this food that seems so avant-garde, but in a way ties me back to legend because his food is avant-garde because he can cook, he can cut any vegetables into something that looks like, you know, throwing stars or origami, you know, or just like the most elaborate placemat, but it's not avant-garde because he uses like a cleaver that's more than 10 years old and everything's done with his bare hands. Nothing is manipulated. It's just him. Yes. He'll, you know, he'll sun dry tomatoes in his California backyard and you'll use that to cook. But what he's cooking is Sichuan food, right? So I go there with Shirley uh, and Carol. We have this two hour dinner. We stay there talking for two more hours. My wife and I remember this because we had a texture babysitter like three times. So we like, my Chinese is not great. Um, Yubo's English is not great. So Shirley and other people are translating. But we spent two hours really talking back and forth about Chinese food and identity and why this is important and just the past present of Sichuan food and how people think that there's only one law and there's mala, but, you know, Lubo was explaining to me, there are dozens of different things in Sichuan that mean spicy. And these are all the nuances. And I just want people to know this and I'm happy to teach people and I want apprentices. Wild, this conversation. And then afterwards, I did maybe the most Chinese thing that I've ever done in my life, where all of us got together in a group photo, had somebody take our photo, and we all posted it on social media. And I remember me posting that my conversation with Yubo in the dinner was maybe the most Chinese thing that I've ever done. And you in the peanut gallery correctly nailed it and posted a comment saying, well, I think taking this picture and posting it is probably the most Chinese thing that you've ever done. But that was the moment where like, okay. I've never been more fully Chinese American than I am at this moment. And since then, it's just gotten deeper and deeper with Dumpling Mafia and LA Food Gang directly doing things for and with the Asian American community. And obviously we're doing this now. So it's great, I think. 
I sort of wonder, I mean, not sort of, I, I wonder a lot about, I grew up in Queens, New York, and I went to a high school that was predominantly Asian American. And I never really thought too much about my identity because I was, I was very privileged to grow up in a, as a teenager in a community where I was not different because I was going to school with lots of people who sort of look like me and came from families who had similar values and cultural, you know, just cultural values that I did. So I'd never really felt like an outsider growing up. But I think as an adult, as we've, you know, disconnected from these, these communities that our parents built for us as we were growing up, I wonder if that has triggered something in you and I where were we really have started to think about our heritage and what that means. And especially over the past two years, you have done some amazing stuff with LA Food Gang that I think has also really recentered your priorities and your focus. Can you talk a little bit about what you guys have done in terms of fundraising? Yes. So Crystal Kozer and I, and um, uh, our friend Yusai, who was moderating LA Food Gang rooms on Clubhouse, the social media app for a while, some chefs reached out to me and they're the ones that really spurred it. We're in the pandemic. We're disconnected. Restaurants are struggling. People are fighting to survive. And there's just added layer of racism that a lot of people are, are dealing with, right? Violence toward our Asian elders, you know, all over the country, right? Just, you know, racist prank calls, racist threats, you know, Ricebox had people call them on the phone and asked if COVID was on the menu. They had people walk into the restaurant, like basically pass the barrier and cough in their direction. And like, look, at this point, I was on Clubhouse and I saw people, you know, like Benny from Next Shark and Daniel Day Kim and Lisa Ling doing their rooms. And they would talk about like, what's next? What can we do? And I was just like, you know what? These people have it covered. I'm not an activist. I don't know how to do this, but maybe we could try using Clubhouse as a fundraising platform. So we did that. And through USAI and through people that we knew in the food world, we had this crazy night where we did a virtual fundraiser on Clubhouse with Lisa Ling, Margaret Cho, Michelle Kwan, Wolfgang Puck, Ruth Reichel, May Lin, Ezra Sochoa, Tim Hollingsworth, and then all of these Asian chefs, you know, like my Dumpling Mafia, you know, friend Shirley Chung. And all we did was go on Clubhouse, listen, talk about our Asian identity. And it raised more than $60,000 because people were just like donating in real time. And we had auction items. And we got national press coverage, international press coverage, TV, you know, local print. And suddenly you realize, wow, you know, the API community really wanted this to happen. So then we did an in-person fundraiser called Pop Off LA, where a lot of these chefs that we loved in LA just collaborated on one-off dishes for one day. And they were sold at different um, restaurants and just venues, you know, during a span of about a week in Los Angeles. And the thing that makes me proud of that you know, beyond the fact that, yes, we raised even more money and that money went to an organization called Off Their Plate that gave that money to Asian-owned restaurant who then were paid to make food for Asian community centers and Asian organizations. That made me extremely proud. But maybe the thing that made me prouder is when we had an after party and a lot of these chefs who'd been so isolated and so disconnected for a year started talking to each other and realized how much they missed talking to other people, realized how much they missed encountering people who understand the grind that they're going through and how hard it is. And since then, they all go to each other's restaurants or talking about collaboration. So with or without Chinese Food Fight Club or with or without Dumpling Mafia or LA Food Gang, even if those things disappear, these people are friends for life. And I think a lot of them are going to do businesses and definitely do more activism and do collaborations together. So, yeah, I mean, it feels good. And I want to emphasize this to anybody listening. Andy and I are journalists. This is activism is kind of not in our training. In fact, I think as journalists, you're generally discouraged from being yeah. an activist because it shows that you're partial. And I think that it's such a testament to how important issues like this have become in our community and 
as as people that that we relate to and people who look like us and people that we grew up with and people who are important to us it is such an important moment for asian americans in this country and what we learned over the past year in terms of clubhouse in terms of audio in terms of video and in terms of just spreading the word through social media is the power of platform and this is why we want to launch this on audio on a podcast because the two things that are most important to us at this point is creating a sense of community around food because that is what we have always naturally done and we think that this can actually create an even bigger movement or even stronger connections both among our immediate first you know first links are our immediate friends but also in in the world at large and what we want to do with this podcast is to create a community between us between the listeners between our guests and so you know we can all talk we can have a conversation yeah and i have a couple of questions for you too danica but i just sort of want to explain too where chinese food fight club has taken us so danica and i are also working on something with the mayor's office of los angeles they have a new api initiative the reason that I got asked to be on this advisory board, you know, with some really much more prominent people than me, people who started unicorn food businesses and people who've directed billion dollar, you know, blockbuster movie franchises, you know, and people who just like people who like really just run things again, like we're just journalists, right? But like, there's like people who are just out there, like shaping, really changing the way that like people in Los Angeles live. And a lot of them have decided to be part of this advisory board. The reason I was even on their radar was because of some of the quote unquote activism that I had done during the pandemic that really when you now that you know the story really did sort of grow out of Chinese Food Fight Club and how that sort of began to change me. So, you know, we've talked a lot about the past, Annika, but I want to ask you a little bit about the future. So we know what the pandemic's been like. We know that we're all isolated. We know that the rest of the world, you know, rest of our lives may just end up being more virtual. But now that we have sort of explained what Chinese Food Fight Club is, what do you want Chinese Food Fight Club to be? And how much of it do you want it to sort of just involve that feeling of going to a dinner party with your friends? Or has something changed where you think that you might want it to be more something else? Well, Andy, I think you know me well enough to know that I want Chinese Food Fight Club to be all the things. But obviously... Yes. Also knowing, you know, how like, you know, we've, we've both been in the media industry for about 20 years. We know it can't be all the things right away. What I do know is that I spent the last two years of my career working in, in, in Hong Kong. And that is the first time I've ever worked in Asia and lived there long term. I've visited countless times. And to me, there are so many amazing stories that are not being told both ways across the Pacific. Right. right. So I think that there is like a little bit of trickling information that comes in from global accolades lists, like all of those restaurants, those top 50 restaurant lists that everyone seems to drop in the same At month. The same I think. time. Yeah. yeah like it, uh. it's great. It's like, it's crazy to me how like everyone seems to have dropped their list in the past three or four weeks. I, they're all cannibalizing each other's SEO if we want to talk about digital. But I also think that being in Asia for so long, I mean, not even that long, it was two years, but being there and overseeing a dining editorial program across eight different markets in Asia, I was running editorial teams in you know, mainland China, Taiwan, Singapore, Malaysia, the Philippines, Indonesia, Thailand, and seeing how underexposed some of the most amazing culinary talent is there it's wild to me that we don't know about it in the US. I'm currently in England. I'll be back in the US in a few weeks. But there is so little information coming out of Asia the other way. And I think you guys will hear on this podcast that Andy and I are obsessed with making our evangelism of Chinese food and Asian food and Chinese American food into reality. I think my favorite thing, I always tell people, my favorite thing in the world, and the reason I keep continue to work in editorial, even though editorial as an industry is sort of crumbling, is my favorite thing is walking into, no one likes meetings, but I love walking into a meeting and sitting around a table with really smart people. And a lot of people who work in media are just really, really yeah. smart, well-versed people. And sitting around a table and having an amazing idea that everybody gets excited about. 
And then when it becomes exciting is when you can walk out of the room and make it happen. And there's not a lot that happens, right? So out of every 100 ideas people get excited about, maybe five make it into reality. But to me, all the things, like Andy and I are like, we were, we're in a group chat with some of our friends and all we talk about are ideas, 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 ideas. Yeah. And at the end of the day, our first step towards taking, you know, to making these ideas real is to put them out into the universe in terms of audio. And we are putting all of these podcasts on YouTube as well. So there'll be visual medium. So you can see the chefs. Some of our chefs come on the show with their families. Some of them are in the kitchen. Some of them yeah. are, you know, it's the context is incredible to see. So we have that we can actualize the experience for listeners and viewers. And then we'll also be launching a website, ChineseFoodFightClub.com. Right now it'll just house the videos and the, and the podcast audio. But eventually I think that the way to make things real in the world is, and it's, this is not like the secret, it's not manifesting. We're not trying to like speak things into existence, <laughs> but literally it's it's that thing where that where they teach you where, where you say like, if you say, I agree, therefore it is so. So it's an active way of us taking our evangelism and putting it out to the real world and trying to connect people, build communities and make things happen. And you guys are making something happen actually in Dumpling Mafia, you, you guys are diversifying that into something really interesting. Would you mind talking a little bit about that project? Because I think that is a great example of what can become reality from, you know, communities and groups. Yeah. So we are um, uh, creating and we're actually creating a series of NFTs with Dumpling Mafia. This is me, Shirley Chung, Carol Chen, the street artist narrator, who's a well-known street artist in Los Angeles. And CoinCloud, which is um, a, a cryptocurrency ATM company, you know, the biggest in the world, in fact. So what we're creating, you know, if you don't know what an NFT is, it is just a way to buy, sell, trade digital art on a ledger, digital ledger called a blockchain. No need to overcomplicate it. A lot of people are buying these things on sites that aren't that different from like buying something on eBay. But what NFTs really are is there are new revenue streams for creators, which chefs need right now. And they're also a way just to build community because a lot of NFTs come with perks. You know, you buy our NFT, you're going to be able to have a virtual meet and greet with Shirley or, you know, go to an actual dumpling party if you live in Los Angeles. And it's just another way, you know, to sort of help chefs figure out how they're just going to get past not just what they've been through in the last year, but just an industry where owners are always used to making less money than servers. And I mean, God bless servers. Everybody wants them, but the model's a little bit broken or there's always this that's wrong with the tip pool or you see the most successful restaurants and they're only making a three and a half percent margin. And honestly, the investors could have just bought bonds and just sat at home and made more money. Like it makes no sense. So a lot of restaurants come out of necessity. They come out of labor of love. I am all for, in this digital age, creating ways for chefs just to become more viable without as much struggle because doing an NFT for the first time is hard. And yes, there have been some late nights where I'm keying stuff into the database. I have a text chain with some of these people, including Shirley, that probably starts at eight in the morning, goes to one in the morning, but it's not harder than rolling 2000 dumplings and then selling them in a restaurant situation where maybe if you're really successful, you're going to make 6%, right? So, you know, NFTs, cryptocurrency, even just people trading things on Robinhood in the last year at home, it's really become a thing because people have been stuck at home. They're, a lot of them are out of work or a lot of them are just like, I want to try something else. And, you know, the thing about cryptocurrency without going down the rabbit hole is that it is decentralized, which means that it is essentially cancel proof, which means that China could say, no, you can't do this, right? And then take down every server and every mine in China, but every other computer in the world can still access the blockchain if you know how to do it, right? So it's just like, it speaks to all these things that, that, that matter, you know, that matter to creators. And we're obviously doing this as a way to you know, celebrate, modernize all those words, Chinese American food, because we're doing images of dumplings and bows and fun and unlikely situations. Um, uh, Shirley and her husband um, uh, 
because of their Chinese heritage, you know, like they're connected to pigs and dragons. So we have a baby pig dragon that just happens to like dumplings, but we also have some very, very, you know, loose interpretations of what a pig dragon, I mean, a pig dragon's already a loose interpretation, but loose American interpretations of what a pig dragon could be if a pig dragon cared about superheroes or a pig dragon cared about sports. So it's just this really fun project. And I think hopefully it's a proof of concept for other chefs, whether they want to do it with us or with somebody else, just to be like, here's another, here's another potential restaurant. I mean, here's another potential revenue stream beyond our restaurant. And I think that like this really ties into another question that I want to ask you, you know, which really ties into what Chinese food fight club is. Yes. We want to just amplify these stories. We want more people to know about Asian American food, Chinese American food, other things that we care about. We've talked about doing crazy things where maybe we just annotate a menu. So when you go to Filipino restaurant, you're not intimidated, but you know, I'm going to confess something a little bit to you, which is just that, you know, I've eaten a fair amount of shabu shabu in my life, but I had never eaten such one hot pot until legend. And that was such a big part of the experience for us. And it was intimidating for me the first time, maybe more intimidating than even um, uh, the first um, uh, dinner downstairs, because it's so interactive and you have to do it yourself and you can make a huge mess. So can you tell me a little bit about your relationship to hot pot, but also the hot pot at legend? Well, the legend hot pot was just for all intents and purposes, I loved going there. And I think I made you go there because I was like, it's just the closest hot pot to Union Square. So it was just practical. Yeah, it, it was the two of us sometimes. It was, yeah, yeah, I was like, us. you know, I think we should go eat hot pot. And um, and I, to me, hot pot is just such a fun winter food because it's so cold outside and hot pot is so hot. I was introduced to hot pot by my family. We used to do hot pot at home when I was a kid. And I guess we were doing Taiwanese hot pot. And at the time, I guess no, maybe when I was a little bit older, Taiwanese hot pot places started opening up in Flushing and there weren't that many, maybe just a handful. And we knew, and I think to be honest, I think that my parents liked going to Taiwanese hot pot places because the Taiwanese places were the ones where everyone had their own bowl. And it just felt like everyone could get exactly what they wanted. And my parents, like, even though they're from Taiwan, they are pretty individualistic in terms of understanding that everyone wants their own thing. Right. So let's not force, let's not voice the family decision on everybody. Like you can have fish, you can have the spicy one. And this was just a way for everyone to have self-determination and for everyone to be happy. And right. after, after that, after that, I, I guess I've been to communal hot pot before, but Sichuan hot pot didn't really take off in New York city, in Manhattan, probably until very recently. Um, I was back in New York maybe two months ago and there's a dollar shop and dollar, it's dollar with just one L. It's, I don't know what mm-hmm. dollar means. Dollar shop. It originally, I guess the, we, I know the one in Flushing. I used to go there all the time. It's my brother's favorite hot pot place. And they opened on third Avenue or second Avenue around 11th street. It's, so popular. You can't even walk in at 4.30 in the afternoon and get a table because every single table is booked. I took my friend, Angie Marr, who owns a restaurant in New York. I took her there and she was like, this is amazing. It, Sichuan hot pot has just not been a huge thing in the in New York until very recently. In Chinatown, there are only a couple of places. There are some all-you-can-eat places. It To me, it just I always felt very, very second nature. It just felt like communal dining, but you got to cook your own stuff. I don't know. Did you grow up eating Korean barbecue? Because that's also sort of a co- like communal. Yeah, I grew. I yeah. ate Korean barbecue there. I grew up in Texas. There's Korean barbecue in Texas. You know, there was definitely some shabu shabu. But I guess the first time, even if you've eaten Sichuan food, you go to Sichuan hot pot and there's a different compartments. And one of them just like looks like flames. It looks so spicy, right? <laughs> and you're just like. So that's the base of everything I'm about to eat. And I'm going to put this thing over rice and there's literally hundreds of chilies in there. It was fun and intense. But what I really loved about going there with you is there'd be times where it'd be the two of us, we would order hot pot and you would still just order entrees from the regular menu too. Cause you're like, we're at legend. Let's get the fish soup. And you would start it. And I'd be like, Oh, but Danica, we're getting the fish soup. Let's also get the pork hock. And suddenly we're eating two meals, which is exactly what you were saying, that we would essentially get yelled at by the server staff. Like, what are you doing? You're two people. 
I think 100% of the time that I've been to hot pot or to legend, if I don't order rice, I will say out loud at some point, and you can guarantee, I think I'm, I've said this to you hundreds of times. I'm like, I'll be like, this is pretty healthy, isn't it? It's just protein and vegetables. Yeah. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's all, it's not, it's, it's, I wouldn't, you know, knowing everything I know now, I wouldn't classify it as super healthy, but it's also not super bad for you. I do think there is something, one of the, to me, one of the charms about Sichuan food, and I, and I've been lucky enough to visit Chengdu a few times, is that even though it looks so dramatic and so aggressive, the beauty of mala is that it doesn't burn your mouth. It's not yeah. the kind of spicy that is on that scale where it's like you're going to give it'll give you scars in your esophagus or in your throat, and you're it's you may have to go to the hospital. Spicy. Yeah, yeah so it's not I, habanero spicy. It's not ghost pepper. It's not Thai spicy. You know yeah. those things melt your face off, and you're just done. Yeah, there's a mala is a is a flavor, and and what you mentioned about yuba before in Sichuan food in and like we, we talk all the time in American food, how there are like five flavors, right? Bitter, salty, sweet, whatever, whatever the other ones are. And then umami is like the new one. In Sichuan food, there are 24 or 25 flavors. And so it's a really different way of approaching flavor profiles and cooking. And that is one of the charms of Sichuan food. And maybe that's one of the reasons why it's taken off so aggressively because of the rise of social media. It is so photogenic and yeah. I, yeah, it's all, it all goes, you know, it's all organic. It all, goes, it all goes hand in hand. Yeah. And I feel like, you know, with Yubo, right. Like telling me things about like, you know, that there's a way to describe a flavor in it, you know, in, in the Sichuan province. And it's just like, this is like fish fragrant spicy. And I'm like, I don't even know what that means, but what I do know is that this is distinguished from all the other spices. So the level of thought and nuance is wild to me and we are now at the point now where you know Sichuan food is starting to go and you you know things like hot pot too are starting to go a little bit mainstream meaning that you know there are big national stories written about Sichuan chili crisp chili crunch lama gone before people even use the terms chili crisp or chili crunch and everybody from david chang to chefs in la have their own riffs on chili crunch that are not necessarily Sichuan but are based on that Fly by Jing, which really is using Sichuan ingredients, now has a deal where they're going to be in grocery stores all over America and they have, you know, Sichuan chili crisp and hot pot line. So I think it's changing. And I mean, I think like this may be a good place to wrap up because the point is, is this podcast is going to get into all of this. And that's what we're here to talk about. We're going to be here celebrating our Chinese American heritage, but mainly just talking about food and creators that we like in food and various other industries.